Does knitting cause you pain? When you knit for more than just 20 or 30 minutes, your neck, your back, your hands, or even your fingers start to hurt? Or are you afraid it could happen? Well, then you are in for a treat because in this video I will share all the little tips and tricks that I found helpful in my well over 35 years of knitting now to prevent knitting pain and avoid injuries. And I specifically structured this video in a way that I show you more than just the same old hand position and stretching exercises that are often just mildly helpful. So I would probably say that five out of the 10 recommendations will come as a big surprise. So let's dive right into it. First, the usual little disclaimer, I am not a doctor and neither am I dishing out medical advice. But I want you to understand why this disclaimer matters even if I was a doctor. See, your knitting pain could be because of a carpal tunnel syndrome. It could be because of chronic tendonitis, arthritis, rheumatism, an inhibited shoulder, a slip disc, or even an allergic reaction to the yarn or the needles. And only a live examination by a professional can tell you for sure what it is and never a YouTube video, even if it was done by a doctor or a therapist. Adapting an exercise based on a wrong self-diagnosis could make things worse or even much worse in the long run. And I really want you to understand this and not exit this video because I didn't show you the supposedly right way to hold the yarn or a stretching exercise in the first 30 seconds. Important, the second you feel pain while knitting, you should stop. Your body is nothing to experiment or toy around with. You only have one and you cannot buy a new one. Well, except maybe your last name starts with a capital K and even then the results are dubious at best. So in that spirit, I want to use the next 30 minutes or so to show you your possibilities to relieve knitting pain and causes for pain, and that will form the basis for your own research. So you have a good starting point and know which professional to approach. Let's show you what I mean. This here is one of my knitting chairs and the first and probably most important thing we need to talk about is posture. It's probably not what you want to hear. You probably want me to show you some ingenious stretching exercise that makes your pain go away after five repeats and maybe tell you that this here is the best way to hold your yarn and this here the best way to tension your yarn or maybe even adapt Norwegian purling because it's so much better. But for me, I have to say that the culprit is typically my overall posture. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The muscles that control your fingers are located in the arm. So where the position of your arms is essential. But those are controlled by your shoulders and ultimately by your spine and the muscles that support it. So when I talk about knitting pain, the very, very first thing I need to address is my overall posture. There are two things that work for me. This chair here, this chair here, the one that I'm currently sitting on allows for very, very erect sitting with the spine neatly stacked. I can also wiggle around a little bit, even jump a little bit and allow those discs here to breathe. My shoulders they are and arms, they are free to move and they're not restricted or pushed upwards or forward by an armrest that is too high or a backrest like that. I'm also less inclined to slouch because that's actually a little bit uncomfortable on such a chair. There are special uh, sitting wedges or maybe you've seen one of these gymnastic balls before that ultimately do the exact same thing. And some people even use a folded towel they put here on their couch for a similar effect. So the effect should be that you sit upright in a very relaxed position. I also have this chair here. It's brand new, but I've been using the same model for almost a decade or so. And the difference is that this is a saddleback chair and it comes with full spinal support. So when I sit on it, 
it nestles here around it and I can also stretch it out like this and it allows for super super dynamic sitting. So I can sit on it like this, I could sit in a lotus seat or I can also sit like this. I can sit on it like this if I want to and I could even turn it around, remove the headrest and sit on it like this and it like this. So this chair here is super super expensive but so worth it for professionals. And you know, I'm not telling you to get this chair, rather be aware that chairs like these exist. At the same time, and if you ask me, the problem is not that you're slouching on the couch like this. The problem is that you are doing it for four hours straight. Typically, at least for me, knitting pain is caused by repeatedly stressing the same areas of your body without compensation. So, I make sure to take frequent breaks. Set yourself a timer on your mobile phone, 15, 20, 30 minutes max, and then you could bring out the garbage, do the dishes, go for a walk, or maybe even do some Latin American dancing, move those hips and let those spinal discs breathe. Open those shoulders and so on. So my takeaway for this section would be, I worked on finding a place where I can sit in a comfortable yet relaxed or supported way. I stay dynamic and I take breaks. For me, it really was not about sitting like it was at the grand family Thanksgiving dinner. Grandma took out the good china and mom would constantly scold me to sit straight because Aunt Susan was on a visit from the big city. For me, it really is about staying dynamic and taking breaks. The second area I really needed to work on was my vision. So if you knit in a too dark place or without your glasses or you don't have glasses yet your close vision is poor. So what will happen is you will bring your knitting closer to your face and bend down your neck and then you will knit a lace shawl of 10,000 stitches like that. So. I would end up compressing my discs here in this area of the neck because the whole weight of my head rests on them. Then I need to lift my arms. So instead of knitting in a relaxed or near relaxed position, there would be a lot of tension in a lot of different areas of my body. And in the long run that will cause pain. It might sound like a minor thing, but again, it is often not this one big issue, but many small little issues that work in concert that lead to pain. So I've been advertising these neck lights here for ages. I'll put a link in the description below in case you're interested because they really change your knitting game. But really use whatever good light source you have available. Natural indirect light is probably the best choice, but never the dark little corner of your living room. And in that context, I quickly need to come back to my break recommendation. Here's a question. Can you hold up a glass of water like this? Probably. Can you do that for five minutes? Can you do it for 10 minutes, for one hour, for four hours? Probably nobody could do that because you would end up with cramps. Yet at the same time, very few people realize that you have muscles in your eyes as well. And if you focus on the very same spot in front of your eyes for four hours straight, the various muscles in your eyes have to do exactly that. They need to hold up the glass for four hours. Not good. So either way, the takeaway or my takeaway in this section is I stopped compensating my bad vision with my posture and again, I take breaks. The next area where I learned to take better care of my body concerns my hands, but maybe not in the way you might think. There are a couple of problems I noticed very early on in my knitting. So as I was knitting with very thin yarn, socks for example, I noticed how the yarn started to hurt my index finger and sort of, well, it burrowed itself into my index finger. Depending on how you tension your yarn, it could be a different finger or a different portion of your hand. Now, there are special patches like that you can put on 
but those never really worked for me and it always feel kind of weird. But maybe they do for you. What does however work for me is using a knitting thimble like this, a Fair Isle knitting thimble. Even if I just knit with one color and it might take a little bit of time to get accustomed uh, to a different way to tension the yarn, but then it really, really worked very, very well for me. The second issue I noticed, and again, it's related to small or very sharp needles is I constantly pushed my tips to move my stitches forward and what happened is that it split the skin to a point, I think at one point it even started bleeding. So I worked on perfecting my technique so that I don't really need to push the tips. It starts with very simple things like pushing the needles against each others to move the stitches forward. But later on you will notice that you can carry your stitches through the natural tension of your fabric. Uh, let me know if that is a topic you would be interested in. Uh, but you know, as a quick remedy, you could cut off one of these with latex knitting thimbles and just put them on uh, the tip of your fingers uh, to prevent them from getting hurt. And the last thing I noticed, how I got calluses in certain places of my hand. So here around the ring finger, but also here uh, in the palm of my hands. And that's because that is where or how I hold my knitting needles and they constantly rub or press against uh, that portion of my hands. And the smaller the needle, the more focused that pressure will be. So your body reacts and here's some pain, some stress, and I create an extra layer to protect you. I'll talk about hand positions later on in this video, but one thing you absolutely need to consider is taking better care of your hands. And this means not washing them too often, using a hand lotion or gloves when doing the dishes, stuff like that, and possibly even even a hand serum in the evening. This here is what I am currently using. I always buy this hand lotion when it's on sale because it's quite expensive. So Black Friday when it's 30 or 40% off and then I always get uh, the full supply for the whole year and this here also very expensive, was a gift from my partner because we recently moved and I had to assemble all the furniture, do paint all the walls like this one here and so on and my hands really started to look horrible. There are also uh, one time use hand masks available at least here in Germany or Austria at the drugstore and I also use them like once a month or so. Now all of these items here are horribly expensive but you know I do this for a living. There are definitely cheaper alternatives available at your drugstore for sure that basically do the same thing with a less fancy name and maybe a simpler packaging but the most important thing here is that you do something. Now despite all care, there are often weeks in the year where my hands see a little bit of extra strain. Moving was such an occasion, sitting in front of the computer, working on my blog for 8 hours or more each day, knitting in the evening and renovating the new apartment really took their toll. And in these cases I used gloves like these. I tried quite a couple of these gloves and here we have some classic compression gloves and they also cover the fingers and those didn't work for me. Only those will wrist supports I guess where the hands are free, those worked for me because I can hold my needles in the normal way with no fabric in between. They are also well, probably very hard to see on camera. Those are wrist supports as well, but they are reinforced inside. So they're rather stiff and those didn't work for knitting either, at least not for complicated patterns. Now it's very, very important to note that depending on uh, the issues you are prone to or might already be suffering from, different things might work better for you. Carpal tunnel syndrome, tendonitis, arthritis, rheumatism, they all can result in hand pain. 
but of course the treatment will be very different and often when there is a recent inflammation gloves might even make things work so for me these work very well these don't but I know for a fact that quite a lot of people I know suffer from it treated and for these these work very well now you might be wondering why I'm suddenly wearing these silly tapes here on my head but here's another very important issue I want to raise uh, that often gets ignored. In fact, I couldn't say I ever heard any other knitter talk about it. So when we knit, or really, when we do any other kind of sports or physical activity, we tend to strain muscles not directly involved in the actual knitting. So typically you will see a lot of uh, bodybuilders with very strong jaws, uh, very pronounced 11 uh, lines and deep set eyes. And that's typically because they push their weights like this. Like that and this leads to wrinkles but also often very very tight muscles in the face area and setting the wrinkles aside it could also lead to headaches the jaw might hurt and so on so actual problems and not just vanity I am someone who furrows his brows when concentrating and I often need to concentrate when I knit so often I knit like this now you can try to train yourself to relax your face, but often that doesn't work very well because a lot of knitting happens on a subconscious level. And these tapes kind of prevent that and it works really, really well for me. And I'm not using them every day, but let's say every second or third day, something like that. These are special Japanese tapes for the face. You uh, can also apply them here around the jaw area and so on. So a lot of, I've seen a lot of beauty bloggers using them as well. Uh, but there are also uh, stronger tapes available here for the shoulder area. And I've seen people use it here around the arms and so on. And they can help to guide and support certain portions of your body or, pre or prevent certain motions. So uh, I've seen people uh, use these here after tenonitis and so on. Important warning here, don't just use any tape and try to replicate what I did here or you know, try to apply a tape here to your arm because you saw it on YouTube or Instagram. If you don't know what you are doing and which product to use, you will probably cause more harm than you gain. But if that is something that interests you, do some research, try to find a professional in your area and together you can work out what works for you and then later on you can do it all on your own. But initially I think you will need some guidance. The next step that really helped me on my journey was learning to knit without looking. If you always have to look down. This will lead to a lot of extra stress here in the neck area because the full weight of your skull and your skull is actually very heavy rests on this little area here. And I did notice that I often had neck or even headaches, neck pain or even headaches when knitting. So if you don't have to look at your knitting constantly, this will help to alleviate some of that pain. It will also help to stay dynamic, uh, which is also very important for your spinal discs. Now, of course, uh, knitting without looking is nothing that I can teach you here in this video. But for me, it made a major difference. Plus it allows you to watch movies while knitting, so how cool is that? In a similar way you can then learn to knit while walking. There are special yarn holders like this one here and they allow you to carry your yarn and your project around as you go. I've seen people in Peru, they wear garments with well, big kimono like sleeves and they store their yarn here in their sleeves. And walking has the big advantage of staying dynamic. And again, you don't end up forcing yourself to stay in the same position for hours straight. Now, please don't do this in areas where you have to constantly watch the traffic. Practice in your backyard first or so. Downtown New York is probably not the ideal place to knit while walking. Let me begin this next section by asking you another question. Does a marathon runner 
only practice by running full marathons? Does a piano player only practice by playing the most advanced pieces by Franz Liszt? Do uh, rugby, soccer or football players only play their games to practice? No, they don't. They go to the gym, they might have special reaction trainings and so on. And likewise, as a knitter, you need to be aware that you have to strengthen your body. Stretch those tendons so you can knit for those four hours. Not straight, but four hours a day. So you can do those marathon knitting sessions. You might not break out in a sweat, but it's demanding in its own right. Looking into where Ways to help your mus muscles, your tendons, and help you through these long knitting sessions is very important. And this doesn't mean you have to go to the gym every day. There are very, very simple yoga exercises I do every second or third morning to start my day. And I really never cared for all that wholesomeness, yoga talk, I'm no vegan, I don't eat bowls and I don't like scented candles for $50 a piece to show the world how mindful I am. Still, that functional yoga uh, really helps me and that's why I do it, even though it does take a lot of persuasion to force me into doing it. But if I don't do it, I start hurting and that is motivation enough. Now, I don't want to show you any exercises here because I am afraid that half of you watching might try to replicate them and it's very easy to cause damage if not done properly. But finding a good uh, professional in your area should be fairly easy because yoga and all these kind of sports have become very, very popular in the recent decade and a session will probably cost less than you typically spend on indie tight yarn. Some yarn and needle companies also offer advice. So here I have a little leaflet. This one is from Knitter's Pride with quite a couple of stretching exercises. Be careful and consider consulting a professional first. Another thing we really need to talk about is knitting needles. So here in my hands I hold special cubic knitting needles. Knitter's Pride offers them, I think Adi does for sure, Prim does, and probably a couple of other companies I forgot to mention here. And as you can see, these are typically square with little, well, ridges in between. And that does two things. First of all, the surface area is bigger. For round needles, uh, the uh, point of contact here is very, very small and the full force uh, is focused on this one point. If you have a flat needle, uh, the force is distributed more evenly. And by the way, that is the reason why a lot of mounted armies use those curved sabers because small blade, big impact. Now, if you have a treaties, that is exactly what you want to avoid. So these needles here, these square needles with the big surface area will be a lot easier on the hands. Plus these little ridges are set to massage the hands. There is a yarn in between, so I'm not sure how well this works, but maybe it helps a little bit. But there is of course more than that. So for example, Prim offers these carbon technology needles and they are super, super, super light. So one of these needles probably weighs like one gram or so. And that too can be a factor because the heavier your needles, the more weight weighs down on your wrists and you need to exert more force to keep your arms in that position and that ultimately could lead to pain. Also, um, do know that uh, uh, circular needles are typically much lighter than using single pointed needles because they too can be very heavy. So when in doubt, try to use uh, circular needles. A lot of people also enjoy wooden needles because they say they are warmer to the touch, which can be a factor if you suffer from a treatise or something like that. Different materials also will make you knit tighter or in a more relaxed way. Now, that is nothing I can tell you. You have to experiment around uh, yourself a little bit, but you will definitely notice that using a different needle 
your most important knitting tool can have a big impact on the way you knit. And I feel this is a topic that really is worth uh, to research and not just pick those Knitter's Pride or Chagu needles because everyone else is using them and I told you to use them and they are the best needles. Big mistake if you ask me. We also need to talk about your technique and I intentionally left this for the very end. First of all, it will be very hard for most knitters to change that. And secondly, I firmly believe that your actual technique doesn't matter all that much in most cases. And it might be quite telling that Carson Demers wrote a full book on knitting ergonomics, but the hand positions barely cover the five pages in his book. The way I see it, no matter the actual position of your fingers, you need to activate muscles to keep the yarn and the needles in place. Your fingers will never be utterly relaxed. That's not possible. You need to hold these needles, otherwise they will fall down. And tensioning your yarn also uh, takes active muscle control. Now your goal should be to knit in a relaxed or near relaxed way and this probably means means your index finger has to be somewhere in this range. But of course, it always has to guide the yarn and that doesn't work when it's not under tension. And also very important, there is just so much focus on the index finger to a point where I see other knitters commenting on my videos and my finger position. First of all, videos often play a little trick, so I hold my finger like that, but if I twist it around so I can uh, shoot the video, it suddenly looks a lot more extreme. Secondly, you gain very, very little if you hold your index finger closer to your needles, but then you need to hyperflex your thumbs or you need to tension your uh, little pinky finger even further or you have to do something crazy with the other hand to accommodate that. And thirdly, don't just focus on the fingers. Your wrists are equally as important. So your whole arm should be as relaxed as possible. And if you constantly need to bend your wrists or even keep them in such a position, then this too can be potentially problematic in the long run. But really, once you are past that beginner stage and you stopped gripping your needles like your life depended on it, I do feel it is so much more important to take frequent breaks and work on your overall posture and all the other little things I mentioned here. Also, be aware that what works for me might not work for you. Think about it. Your hands, your fingers, your arms might be shorter or longer or thicker or stronger or weaker or older. But those needles, they all and that yarn all have the same size. And in that light, I also want to raise the awareness that there are different knitting styles. And very often I get the comment, comments like this, I switched to continental knitting because I couldn't uh, continue with English throwing due to my arthritis. But no week passes where I get the exact opposite comment and, and people saying, well, I did a continental knitting all my life and now I had to switch to English throwing because continental didn't work anymore. And, you know, then there are people who rave all about Norwegian purling or knitting backwards to avoid purling altogether or combination knitting. For you, the main takeaway is that there are different knitting styles, that there are ways to take the stress away from the hands altogether or certain portions of the hand. And any form you know, of lever knitting where you hold your needles under the arm or in a knitting belt or sheet, uh, ultimately, this all these knitting style means there is less stress on the hand and on the wrist. Or take uh, Portuguese knitting, knitting where you tension the yarn around the neck and so on. This all this means or can mean that certain portions of your body experience less stress. But it could also mean that certain other portions experience more or different stress that is harmful to you. So listen to your body and try to experiment around a little bit. You will instantly notice what works good or 
not so good for you. Norwegian knitting has already been mentioned and it can be a very attractive style because purling uh, doesn't require you to bring the yarn to the front and typically the fingers are so much closer to the knitting needles. But I also want you to take into account the sheer weight you need to carry while knitting. So only recently I had a lady commenting on one of my videos saying that she preferred knitting socks toe because this means she can store the yarn in the actual sock in the making as she knits along, sort of like a little yarn bow. I personally couldn't do this because it would mean my project would be what, like 50, 100 grams heavier than it already is and my hands would have to carry all that extra weight. And it would be even worse if you knit sleeves two at a time or so. A lot of people also say that cushioning the arms is helpful as well. So again, this means the shoulders don't need to carry the full weight and for people with a treatise or something like that, this could mean all the difference. So for example, there are here, you can on Amazon, you can get them, these nursing pillows and you can, uh, uh, you can wrap them here around your body and then you can rest your elbows on them and this uh, could really help to take away all that heavy weight from your shoulders and your arms. Support like this can be a two-edged sword if you ask me because it also can lead to bad habits or muscles tendons deteriorating over time but of course I'm mentioning this here because a lot of people find this here super super helpful. This is a nursing pillow. And of course, if you are working on a big project, try to support it while working on it. So maybe maybe even put a little uh, cushion on your lap to support it if it isn't long enough. Because if you have that full chunky blanket uh, pulling on your wrist, that probably isn't the best idea either. There is one thing I would like to mention here, and it is a very important point. Not all knitting styles are equally suitable for all patterns. I personally prefer to knit very complicated advanced patterns. And while things like lever knitting or combination knitting can reduce the stress on the hands, they can make knitting those super complicated patterns even more difficult. Either because you need to convert the pattern and all the stitches or because knitting those, I don't know, purl three together through the back loops is even more difficult to knit. So that is definitely something to consider in both ways because if you still experience pain or discomfort, then maybe knitting different patterns or uh, using bigger or smaller needles or easier stitches is uh, the path you need to take. And so often you hear, when people talk about knitting ergonomics, you hear stories about the crofters in Scotland and where not, but typically they would just knit stock knit stitch in the round. Traditional Shetland scarf, the, these, these fabled heirloom scarves are as far as I know, just exclusively knit in garter stitch and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is my knitting style might not be the most ergonomic ever. I'm very aware of that, but since neither the working needle nor the uh, working yarn nor the tensioning finger are in a fixed position, it's also a very, very versatile style. It works very well for me. I don't experience any pain, but maybe it doesn't work for you. And then you have the whole internet to explore and search for new styles and new projects and new needles and new yarn and find what works for you. And always try to avoid, well, not mansplaining, but you know, explaining the world to others. So for example, every third day or so, I get someone commenting on my videos that they learned to backward knit and now they don't ever need to purl again and uh, I should do that too. Well, first of all, I don't think purling is uh, difficult at all. And even if I thought it was, well, I rarely knit flat. And if I do, <laughs> I never, um, I never knit stock in knit stitch. So backward knitting, well, when I knit bobbles, it certainly comes in handy. But other than that, why would I need it for? But maybe it's exactly what you need to learn. 
Anyway, that was my video on how to prevent knitting pain. Again, I am only a knitting professional and if you need help, if you are in pain, always consult a doctor or a therapist and never just a YouTube video. Happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.